Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. In this week's episode, I welcome Gord Kuypley. Gord is a father, husband, and son who lives in Calgary and also works in the energy industry. Gord enjoys spending his time with family, playing the guitar, and reading about ways to expand and diversify the experiences in his life. He also has a podcast called The Second Act Podcast, which I've had the honor to be on as a guest. And in this podcast, Gord aims to share the stories of people doing what they want to, not what they have to do, and working with people who are open to new ideas. In this episode, Gord and I talk about the ego and how to manage situations where the ego can run our lives. Gord shares some of the stuff he does to manage his ego and how often when we're operating from the ego, how it can lead us astray. The book Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday inspired this conversation. It's a book that Gord reads every year and I recently read. So we wanted to share our own experiences of reading this book and what we got out of it. You can find Gord on Instagram at the second act pod and find his podcast on all podcast platforms. And also, if you could leave a five star review at the end of the episode, I would truly appreciate it. All right, Gord. Oh, there's a timer. There we go. All right, Gord, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I've had the honor of being on your podcast. So, uh, the second app podcast so we'll give you an opportunity to talk to a little bit but uh yeah so i'm super excited about this conversation but before we get started i always give guests an opportunity to introduce themselves talk about what it is that they do and uh and then we'll jump into the conversation so over to you well thanks very much for i sure appreciate the opportunity to participate in this uh, wonderful forum that you've cultivated for these conversations um getting to know you over the last year or so. I see uh, some of the work you're putting into some of the difficult conversations, whether it's in, you know, men's mental health space or, or just in, you know, people understanding why they feel the way they feel about things. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. So, yeah, my name is Gord Kitely. I'm a regular dude who works in the oil field in, in Calgary, Alberta. Um, I, I'm married. I have two kids. I've kind of had a, a pretty you know normal kind of life things have gone pretty well we've we've had a good good run here in oil oil and gas um a couple of years ago through covid there was some changes in my life that kind of made me want to take a step back and look at things around me and uh it was it was an interesting um it was an interesting exercise because i don't think a lot of people that would have known me kind of growing up you would have would have described me as self-aware i was probably um the, one of the least self-aware people that that you would have ever known years ago because I was kind of a big personality and 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 just assumed that everybody liked that and uh, through all this I've kind of learned that there's so many other ways that people can be perceived and and I was like confronted with the fact that I wasn't being perceived the way I always thought I was. So I, I kind of wanted to embark upon a journey like that. And, and then to your point, I, I did start a podcast where I kind of decided I needed to figure out how to work with that and, and talk to people and understand. And, and so I thought that would be a great way to kind of get to meet new people and go down that path. And through all that and through a couple of other different, you know, uh, people that you and I know commonly and, and stuff, I've kind of fallen into this, I don't know if it's a, a trap, so to speak, but it's like this world of where there's people out there that are on that same journey with me. Some are a little ahead, some are a little behind, some are right on par. Mm -hmm. And it's so much fun to just sit down and talk to those people and figure out where they're at, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And help, like for the, for the listeners, are you able to help us understand the whole concept behind the Second Act podcast? Because I think there's a deeper meaning behind it. And, um, you know, you've kind of shared your own experience at a high level, but what is the concept behind it and what really inspired you to want to have these conversations? I know you mentioned trying to get to understand the whole aspect of self-awareness, but 
there is a deeper meaning behind it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's actually in about 2018, I have emails, um, from, from 2018 where I, I came up with this idea and it was through, um, you know, uh, through work, I met a couple of different people and one of them is, uh, you know, uh, has a reasonably high profile in, in Calgary and, and the other, his business partner well, didn't. And once you got to know them both, there was one who was significantly more interesting at a personal level than the other, both great guys. But yeah. it was like this other guy over here that nobody knows his name is a super interesting guy. He had all these different artistic ventures and these different business interests and the way he, you know, interacted with people. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many people uh, just on the bus at the grocery store have that second part of their life that they just nobody's bothered to ask about or nobody's interested in. And and what what goes into that second act mm -hmm. and so i i started poking around and i started realizing that there are so many people out there that are doing something different than what they started out doing or they got doing something and found the fulfillment wasn't what they thought it was going to be the you know the juice wasn't worth the squeeze so to speak mm -hmm. and they just departed and they started doing something different and those are the stories that we we kind of aim to seek out and illustrate on the second act podcast and and we've had you know uh, a plethora of of guests that have different stories we've had people that have been you know in jail and now they're on the second part of that coming out and, and getting their life back we've had uh you know politicians and we've had musicians and people that lived a normal regular nine to five life and the one lady kind of honed her gift as a psychic medium and that's what she does. And, and it's just all these people that you may never think to ask the question about because they're just a person that's in your life. And meanwhile, they're doing all this incredible stuff, this incredible work in the background to really f fulfill their, their life and make sure that they're getting the most that they can. And, and those are the stories that we just want to highlight and, and let people know that they're everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, based on the episodes I've listened to, and I've, you know, I haven't listened to all of them, but there is a common theme, and I want to get your thoughts around that. Like, do you believe the common theme there is all these people at some point in their lives encountered adversity, and and we could say adversity is relative, right? There, it, there's no like way to measure it, but they encountered adversity, which almost, in a way, acted as a catalyst for them to seek out this second act and perhaps look at something different in their lives almost exclusively for i would say um there's almost no point where someone truly falls into it like like they would say like oh i just fell into this it, it, no you didn't something happened um and and you you realized you had a realization and and you decided that that there was something in that spark in that moment that you needed to pursue and mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's difficult because sometimes it's not clear to the person and, and we've kind of had aha moments on the pod where, you know, we, we edited it out and the person's like, wow, I, I never thought of it like that. And you have that conversation in the moments and then you kind of piece it all together. And, and then when you listen to the edited podcast, you think, well, that was smooth, but, but it wasn't, it, and, and it never is. And, and that's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like probably a good segue into our conversation today so you know gordon and i have decided to talk about the ego and i think both of us um came across it because we you read it actually every year but i just re read it recently i would say three months ago ego is the enemy by ryan holiday and there's an aspect of adversity that you know, we talk about from an ego standpoint as well and, and how to manage that. Um, so, so perhaps before we jump into that, um, do you want to share why is this book so profound for you that you feel like it's an important read every summer? So the, the way that um, the, the Ryan Holiday's writing on the Stoics, but specifically um, Ego is the Enemy, came to me was a, a former co-worker who, who was really uh, driven by, by the writing of the Stoics and specifically Ryan Holiday, the, 
the stillness is the key, obstacle is the way, and, and ego is the enemy uh, trifecta. He he was moving on from, from a role, and he handed me a book, Ego is the Enemy, and inside it just said, hey, I think you might get something out of this. And I have a lot of respect for him. We were good friends. We still are. Um, and on its face, I was like, oh, okay, uh, I'll read it because I respect you and I want to understand why. But when you're handed a book that's called Ego is the Enemy from somebody who's departing um, out of your day-to-day life, it's like this can go one of two ways, right? And I was already kind of into my um, direction that that maybe things weren't going as well as I thought or I'd hoped, and I needed to look at a little more introspectively at how, how I was reacting to things. So I read the book, and the first time I read it, I was like, this is crazy. Like, all this is is, is, a, is a, yeah, when you look at something that happened a thousand years ago, through the lens of current times and with all the lessons that we've learned since, it's really easy to look back at it or, or the, you know, the specific about how Jackie Robinson, you know, did the things that he had to do and, and kept a, a stiff upper lip. Well, of course, he's a hero now. It's easy to look back on it. Mm-hmm. So I specifically gave myself six months and then I went back and reread it and had some time to mull it over, had some opportunities to see things in my life and use those the those lessons learned and lo and behold it was it was less threatening it was more useful and and then every time i've read it since i i you know i'm a big music guy so the first time i read about it and i read the the chapter about metallica that was the one i i really honed in on well now that i've read it a half a dozen times I'm reading some of the other ones that are about some of the philosophers and, and using those lessons. And lo and behold, all these lessons kind of compound on each other. And so now I find myself every spring really looking forward to the opportunity to dive back into the book and see which one's going to stick with me this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great thing about it is there's tons of stories in that, uh, as you mentioned, you initially gravitated towards the Metallica portion, but you know, there's a lot to take out of it. Um, you mentioned threatening. What about the book, like at least in the beginning, felt threatening? Because I'll share my own experience too. But yeah, what, what, for, uh, what about it was threatening for you? So if, if I had not been as aware um, going into it, I don't think I would have been threatened. But because I was aware that there were some cracks in the way I perceived myself, uh, I was, I felt really threatened about reading that book and wondering what I would see. Um, was this going to be an expose of Gord? You know, and, and at that point I was in my early forties, I'd been up fairly successful. My family was healthy. Um, I, I felt like I'd done all right. And the last thing I really wanted to do was read a book that was going to say, all of that is in spite of these behaviors. And it was threatening to me to, to want to go in and, and do that exercise. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, uh, I'm glad you shared that because that was a very similar experience for me in terms of reading the book was the almost humbling in the sense that, you know, my ego shows up almost every day. And it's, it's one of those things you have to be so mindful of and um at least for me i have to be aware of it when it shows up and presents itself and the reason why i felt adversity is a great way to start probably talking about the ego because i've had my times with adversity and and it's easy to be able to blame circumstances or other people for the challenges that come into our lives and and that's the ego really talking from my perspective and often we have to take a step back and, you know, keep that ego in check, but also understand what is it that we're doing to bring those situations into our lives? What is our role or how are we going to choose to react and, and show up differently? And those are where some of the realizations I had, even in the, the smallest things that occur on a daily basis, it's easy to get flustered and, and blame other people and get upset with other people. So I don't know if you have similar thoughts or, or what your experiences is, because um, there's 
the reason why I'm going with adversity is because the book is broken into three sections and one of them is around failure and how the ego shows up. So I wanted to perhaps touch on that, but yeah. So the, this, the part around that and managing that, that reaction um, really sunk in with me about the second or third time through uh, when the John Wooden portion of the book about how um, the, the winningest college football or pardon me, basketball coach of all time was decidedly dispassionate about things. He did not bring passion. He was purposeful. And as I looked into that, that, that was counterintuitive, right? Follow your passions. That's what everybody tells you. If you, you know, if you do what you're passionate about, you'll never work a day in your life. And here we have this person who's kind of by and large accepted as the pinnacle of success in his chosen field. And anyone around him will tell you that he was decidedly dispassionate. And it was the the difference between passion and purpose that sunk made it sink in with me is is that passion is an emotion mm-hmm. and purpose is a reason. And to the per, to, to the uninitiated, and I'm not saying I'm initiated, I'm just saying at, the, at this point I, this is where I got with it. I was running on emotion almost all the time um, through through things that had happened in my life. Uh, emotion, had, I'd, I'd always kind of been able to straddle the knife's edge to to be emotional enough that um, I was I, I really cared about things, but I never let it spiral out of control. And it was becoming harder and harder as things like my career became more important to my family's well being. My children became older and were were interacting with other people and. And as anyone you know who who has children can tell you, um, there there's something very uh, very concerning when when your child is when you're perceiving your child's being attacked, your emotions take over, and if you don't have control, if you're not able to you know carefully vet how you react to that, you're going to be in a world of trouble. And I could see as my kids got older, I was doing that, and that part of the book came along at a really good time where I was like, oh, purpose and passion are different. Mm-hmm. Passion doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be the happiest at the end. And we have to figure out how we're going to react to these things. And it's all based off of the emotion of the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and what are you doing now to kind of help you maintain that? Because, you know, often we, we realize things, but then we have to put practices in place to be able to maintain those realizations so you know and and i think some of the stuff you mentioned earlier but what are the things you're doing to maintain some of those realizations so the the very first thing i did i realized that i had to do was to control the things that i can control in my life and one of the number one things that i did um was i really dialed my my alcohol consumption back Mm. um i was you know, always having a beer in the garage. <laughs> that was me. And now it's like, if I'm going to be in control of everything all the time, that was something that I had to take back as much for my own ability to say that I did it as for anything that happened while I'd have been having a beer or two. Right. And then the other part is, is the communication piece with, with my wife and my family. Um, it, it, it I'm doing it more planfully. I, I write a journal and I, I go and attend some men's groups so that I'm comfortable with how I feel. Um, I do have a coach that I work with on personal growth and we have these conversations. I flesh out these ideas so that when I sit down with my children or my wife, uh, I'm not trying to wing it as I go. I'm, I've, I've constructed how I feel. I've given reflection to it before we talk about it. And the best part about that is they understand the work that's gone into it. And if I say something that, you know, may be construed as hurtful or, or um, not necessarily what they were expecting, they understand it's not a reaction. They understand that, that there's been a bunch of work put into it, and that's how I feel. And we have to go from that point, and, and not, it's not a reaction to something else that's going on around me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's important. And, and again, thank you for sharing that. I think there's an aspect of vulnerability there, don't, don't you think? Um, and, and the fact that you're being vulnerable, it gives everyone around you, especially your family, also some grace and compassion for how you're showing up. So like you said, if there is something or whether you make a mistake, I think they also, they're also 
giving you that compassion and the fact that you're being vulnerable? Do you feel that's helping in that sense? Absolutely. And one thing that I've, I've learned over the last few years is the vulnerability is always there. It's whether or not you're going to acknowledge it. And people are aware of your vulnerabilities, whether you're willing to acknowledge them or not. Um, the, the struggle is in that acknowledgement, that self-awareness of the vulnerability. And that's how quickly you're going to get to work on those areas is, is the sooner that everyone's willing to acknowledge that they're there. And, and so that's something that I work really hard at. And it's hard to do as a family unit sometimes because not everybody wants to admit their vulnerabilities. And, and, and I don't always want to admit mine. There are times where it's hard, um, but at the end of it, um, if I want to be, you know, the captain of the team or however you want to say it, I have to lead in a manner that, that I wish to lead people. And so I, I, I work really hard to try to acknowledge those vulnerabilities when I'm having a bad day, bad week, uh, when I'm tired, when I'm not getting the results that I want with the people around me through the interactions that I'm, uh, that I'm leading. It's, it's really important that I acknowledge the fact that this isn't going well. Let's start over again. Yeah, yeah, I think that's amazing and, and it's so important to do, but to your point, very hard to do at times, especially when those emotions, as you alluded to earlier, are raw. It, it's hard to, I, I think, first of all, my belief is we don't have the language to be able to kind of explain those emotions. Um, so that's a struggle on its own. And then it's also hard to, to be able to admit them at times because some of them are, are, are difficult emotions to talk about. So uh, I appreciate your point around it is a work in progress. And I think a lot of us are doing the same work. And, and, and the fact that we're doing it is obviously helping us move in the right direction. Uh, but yeah, so, so I think, you know, we talked about one of the areas of the book around failure and uh, how the ego comes in. Another area is where a lot of us are embarking on something, uh, whether it's a new opportunity, new career, some hobby, new goals in life in general, there's always a lot of hard work that needs to go in at the beginning. And, and quite often when the results aren't there or the outcomes aren't as we expected them to be, it's easy for the ego to kick in in those moments as well. And maybe create a narrative in our mind that, you know, we're, other people are just luckier than us or good things aren't meant to happen for us and therefore we should give up or whatever. However, the ego wants to trick us. What are your thoughts around that? And what are some things that you've built into your practice or people, or you think people should kind of work on when, when we're going through those situations in life, especially early on when you're trying to work towards something? That's a, a great point and a great, uh, question, I guess, um, because I did that through starting my podcast. Um, you know, I I was fairly sure, certain that I was going to get a good run of guests and things were going to go, and, and, it, and it did. I mean, I, I had an unbelievable start, kind of first 20 or 25 episodes to my podcast. Um, and then I've, I've hit this opportunity to kind of reflect back and, and what am I putting into it? What am I getting out of it? And I've kind of fallen into the trap of um, you know, relying on what I, what everybody thinks ego is, which is your, your th sense of self-worth versus what ego actually is, which is how you perceive yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of, I have to remind myself that you've had some success. That was the plan just because it's not in this episode that you thought went really good and should do well, didn't isn't a statement or a commentary on you or that guest or how you put it together. It's how it landed. Um, you, you put out a podcast on Monday about a beer drinking lady and through the weekend, when you kind of thought that people would pick up on that, um, the U S Supreme court overturned Roe v. Wade. And I mean, I can't control that. That's just how it goes. So did I probably, instead of a bunch of people tweeting and, and Instagramming about this beer maven that is going around Calgary, taking people on these crazy beer tastings, are they tweeting about other things and, and advertising that? Absolutely. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there isn't room for me to improve and I can't do that, but that self-reflection, 
is separate from how I perceive myself and, and the work that goes into that success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's important as well. And how would you think, how would you say that's changed from say the previous version of Gord, the the one, you know, you said before this whole self-awareness journey. Oh man, you're not, you don't ask for much, do you? Um, so, uh, the previous version of Gord would have had a, a reasonable amount of reasons why that this was not his fault and he'd done all the right things. Um, because I always was, you know, fairly planful and, um, you know, I, I didn't do things very often without reason. So, so I had it in my head that I had looked at all the angles and this is my decision. This was the path. It was the best one. And when it didn't work out, it had nothing to do with the fact that I had miscalculated or that something had changed. And to be honest with you, I, I kind of started to come to terms with this um, as I started to listen to sports radio and people would change their picks. And everyone, the callers would yell at them about, you said flames in six, and now you're saying flames in three. And the guy would say, yeah, but I thought, I thought Goudreau was gonna be in, wasn't going to be injured. I have new information. I get to change my pick. And in my head, I was like, man, that's so applicable for everything in life. All we do is get new information. And yet somehow, because of our ego, because of the way we perceive ourselves, we're beholden to these decisions that we made so long ago. And it's just, it's so absurd, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, we're in a different world too, where anything we go out and say is almost out there now, especially yeah. with social media, you can't really retract stuff but uh i think there's yeah and and the antidote always for uh for ego is humility and and i think being able to accept the fact that hey you know i had different information at the time or sometimes we have blind spots too right and we don't consider all the information that's in front of us um that's important too but i think the biggest piece that you mentioned and i've also appreciated over the last little while is considering every opportunity as something we can learn from, right? So if the results aren't what we expected, it's understanding why. Why are the results not the same that we thought they were going to be? And um, sorry, go ahead. You have something to say. Well, I just, I think it's an interesting concept because the arrogance that goes into the assumption of the result, right? Like that's yeah. part of all of this conversation as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think there's a deeper aspect too when, when you think about it is why do we want those results to be the way, you know, like why did you want this episode to do so well? And I think often there is an aspect of ego attached to that as well because it's something we're putting out into the universe and we expect it to do really well because we believe we put in all this time and effort and, and creativity and thought behind it, but there's also millions of people doing the same thing. So what's the difference? Well, well and, and even an episode of a podcast or uh, a project at work or even um, your child, you know, um, you put all this effort into taking your child to the piano recitals and you you buy the piano and you get the extra lessons and you put all this effort in and then they go and they they don't get hot cross buns right and you're you had this in your head of what it was going to be and it doesn't meet that and it goes back to that arrogance from the ego like who are you to assume and i think that's a really hard thing that you um just get to assume that all this hard work's going to equal success and I'm not going to get into participation metal culture and all that stuff, but I, I will say that um, we don't do a great job of dealing with failure, teaching people to deal with failure, or even accepting it, that it's part of the process. And you'll find the truly successful people, like the, the Olympic medalists and the people that are you know, on the you know, J.K. Rowling's of the world that, that are wildly successful in their chosen field, failure is as much a part of their story as anything to do with success. And they've, they've learned to, you know, deal with it, manifest something different out of it. And we, we don't necessarily do that because we have so much available to us that if we fail at one thing, we're just on to the next one. And we always just assume because of our ego that we're going to be better at the next thing based on what, right? No, there's no reason to, to assume that, but that, but that's kind of where we're at. 
Well, and I think it's aspect. There's an aspect of culture, too, where, you know, a lot of successful people you only hear about their successes, right? Like, you know, whether it's the the Olympic medalists or as, the, you know, successful authors, you don't hear about all the grind and and you know all the times they failed, because that's not really talked about. So for do you do you believe that though, or do you like I I actually would argue that. If you want to find out about the grind, there's no end to the avenues with podcasts. And, and I think there's people that are truly successful that put their failures out there to see. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I don't believe that. I think the information is there. But through media and stuff, what's talked about generally is the success, right? They're not talking about, oh, you know, this guy uh, failed. And, and one of the most recent examples I came across was uh, I happened to read Will Smith's book and and you don't really hear about everything that happened in the background you kind of know okay this kid came out of nowhere had a successful tv show and then ended up becoming this the most successful actor in Hollywood history but you don't talk about or at least it's not talked about in terms of like him basically being broke at one point yeah until he shared it in his book right so I think there there is an aspect of culture where a lot of people almost are misled or or assume that everyone's who you know successful in their field they just were were talented and then they picked it up and became successful and and there's not a lot of conversation around all the hard work that went behind it and all those uh, failures that allowed them to learn uh, from those failures. Well, and think of the, um, I don't know what the right term is, but how secure Will Smith has to be in his position, you know, going on with all that's going on in the world around him to put that out there in a book, right? Like that, you know, that's an ego based thing as well, that he's in a position where he can say, look, I'm good enough today that I will tell you how bad it was before. And a lot of people won't do the bad as was before until it's good enough today. And what happens if you never get there? Then to your point, nobody will ever talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of, you know, when you're, you're aspiring for something, obviously there's going to be, um, failures and, and obstacles along the way. What's kind of your biggest takeaway from that aspect when it comes to the ego? Well, the the biggest takeaway around um, trying to avoid the failure while you're aspiring is to be c- comfortable with the fact that you're not going to avoid the failure while you're as- aspiring. Um, you have to you have to be ready for it. You have to be aware of it. You have to recognize early when things aren't going in a manner that you you'd wish or that you'd hoped, so that you can make the adjustments. Now that's that's a hard thing to do. That's around that self awareness piece that we talked about. Yeah. But but the other part of it is actually being able to commit to making the change that that is required to come. And that's that's where I struggled. I you know, I made I made I had changes in my life that I recognized uh weren't compatible with, with who I was and, and how I, I lived. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, and I said, I put my hand up and said, I'm willing to make changes so that, that we're more in alignment. I I really wasn't because I didn't believe in it. Um, now it it resulted in a bunch of changes in my life, better, worse, and different, but I, I, I didn't have both pieces and that's the critical piece is if you have to recognize it and then you have to be able to commit to make the change or make the change in your life, one or the Mm -hmm. other. Um, and, and that to me is, is the hardest part because it requires so much introspection, so much self-reflection and you have to be serious about it because if you're fake about it, if you're not taking it seriously, everybody will see it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so important. And, and yeah, thank you for sharing that. So I guess the last part of the book, uh, that I want to touch, and I think that's probably in my mind, the hardest and, and most fascinating for me is when you're successful and, how the ego kicks in and there's times where people um, I think myself included at one point in my life I did feel invincible because I had everything I had possibly dream- dreamt of 
you know, the family, the house, the car, the job, the career, everything. And yeah, there was this sense of pride in my life and I would say almost arrogance around, okay, well, you know, like I've done everything. Like, yeah. So anything I'm going to touch is going to turn to gold. But I think there's, again, the aspect of humility that needs to come in and for us to always remember where we started at least for me that was kind of the biggest reminder and and how quickly things can get taken away uh and and i think also building some compassion for other people but what what are your thoughts around that when ego takes over especially when we're at the the height of something well it's it's very difficult i think to recognize that you're at the height of something um and and when you're when you're working towards something and you're starting to realize those goals and and the fruits of that labor um, if you're not you know if you don't have people around you that will hold you to a dose of humility it's really easy to end up on a on a trajectory where you think i deserve this because i've done this not realizing that your starting blocks might have been so far ahead of the guy behind you that he's worked just as hard uh, for a fraction of what you have. And, and, and there's all that that goes into those calculations and equations as well. But I, I just think that if, if you're being serious and honest about what your goals were all along and you're managing them, um, there's, there's an opportunity every step of the way to avoid those pratfalls. It's when the goal as a 22 year old college graduate is to be a director at a company there's so much that can happen in between there mm -hmm. that you can lose your way. If the goal is to find and secure employment, that's a goal, manageable goal. And then from there you get into a company and you say, I want to be a sales lead by the time I'm 25. That's a goal you can manage. If you just find yourself at 34 years old as a director with the house, with the family, with the car, um, you, you're going to gloss over a lot of, what actually went into making that happen and chalk it up to, Hey, I'm just Gordon. These things happen for me. Right. Yeah. 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 So what are some things that people can do though, to, to be mindful of that? Cause I know for me, it's always, again, I had to go through some difficult uh, experiences to really recognize that, but uh, just constantly reminding myself that a, like I'm, I still need to work hard, continue to work hard, but also be grateful for anything that comes into my life. And I think the biggest piece for me is being able to give back and serve people. But those are things that I keep in my daily practice to, to be able to keep my ego in check. It's still hard because often I catch myself still, uh, whether it's having a debate or having a conversation and thinking I know more or I know it all. Um, that often happens and I have to keep that in check. But what are some things that work for you or some things that you do to, to keep yourself in check? So the, the two things that I am consciously aware of um, that I do is I curate the people in my life. I make sure the people in my life are going to hold me to account, hold me to a higher standard. And I make sure that I'm not getting away with things, whether it's, uh, I don't know, not taking care of myself, not spending time with my family. There's going to be people that are like, come on, we should be golfing 72 holes a week. There's people out there that do that. I could find those people and I could go golf 72 holes a week, but that's not who I am. Who I am is the guy who has to, plan a week ahead of time or 10 days ahead of time to get out for 18 holes every three weeks. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to align myself with people that, that are similarly minded so that I don't find myself getting out into a, an area where, and, and as a younger man, I very much was the guy who wanted to go quadding every weekend while my wife was home with the kids. Well, I mean, come on, that's not sustainable. That's not what this is all about. That's not why we entered into all of this. And as I've said that, I completely forgot the second part of what I was going to say. So, yeah, I don't know if you can edit that out or not. 
Well, I think so. First part, you said surrounding yourself with like-minded people. Um, but but I'm curious about because you mentioned earlier you had, you know, the first 20, 25 episodes were successful as you mentioned. Um, so when that was happening, you know, obviously starting a podcast is not an easy task. There's a lot of vulnerability attached to it. You're putting yourself out there. You're exposing yourself to criticism. So when things did go well, how were you able to maintain that aspect of ego and, and still have that humility and, and continue to do more with the same level of excitement and passion? Well, the passion never wavered, so or the excitement level never wavered, so it was easy. It was it was a self fulfilling thing, um, and and you know by the time I hit I think episode twenty five was my first um, episode that ever cracked a thousand downloads, and it was like this is easy when you're seeing that kind of response. Um, I it was it was no no trouble at all to keep it going, and I. There was enough because there's a guest on each podcast. There was enough correlation between the the really interesting guests or the ones that whose story was just a little unique or maybe they were a little more engaged. They would do just better than some of the other ones. That I kind of understood that I was just as dependent on the guest as me. Um, talking to some people that that have podcasts and and coach people. You know, they, they want to get away from that. The, ultimately, you need people to want to tune in to listen to your take on their story, and that's how you maintain that that steady trajectory. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I kind of thought, okay, I've got this base. I've got these numbers that are holding pretty steady through 25 episodes. And I started to do some other ones that I found more interesting, and maybe I just didn't have people tuning in to hear my take on their story yet. And, uh, and maybe that's kind of why things leveled out. They haven't dropped. It's, it's still going well, but I, I certainly haven't maintained that. And maybe I never was going to, you know, maybe there's that part of it too. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But what was, how were you able to, at least when you saw that success, uh, maintain like the ego though? Cause I think it's easy to get carried away. Right. Like I, I think if, I'm just putting myself in in those shoes. Like, you know, I've had some episodes that have taken off too. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, here we go. <laughs> but yeah. uh, often reality hits and you're like, okay, well, I still have a long ways to go here. So, yeah, but even, you know, on your journey in, the, in a similar vein, um, y- you just know that it's, it's not you. Even when it's going really well, you're a part of it. Yes. Um, you just know that because there's so many variables, you know, we talked about the news cycles that happen and the different things, you know, I've, I've had, um, people that have a a small social media following that promote an episode that they appear on very hard and it does really well. I have people that have a large social media following that don't mention it and I'm tagging them and that's how their audience is finding them and it doesn't do as well. And there, I can't control all of that. So by the time I kind of got into, you know, episodes, let's say 30 through 50, I had a pretty good handle on this is how I do it. I've done my research. You know, I look at my analytics and see when the people that interact with my content, when they're on, I make sure that I get my stuff out during those times. The, the captioned videos do well. The reels on the Sunday introducing don't. So I changed up how I do that. You know what I mean? Like I'm, and, and yeah. that's, that's how I'm managing that. I, I, I don't think I've ever kind of took it all for granted that people were tuning in to, to hear my voice or see my face. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and it's important, as you mentioned, like the, the experimentation, because, you know, even when we feel like we've reached a, some level of success, it's always important to recognize that we can still learn and, and there's always something to learn and improve on. And I think there's a lot of stories that were shared <clears throat> by Ryan Holiday in that book as well around these people who continue to maintain that same level of drive and thirst for, for knowledge to be able to continue that level of success. And there's others who, as you mentioned, take it for granted and often that success is short-lived. 
yeah, and I think ultimately the more refined your goal is, the easier it is to stay driven towards it. I think if your goal is to be famous, well, maybe TikTok dancing or a podcast or unboxing videos on YouTube is your is your way there. If your goal is to meet interesting people and share their stories in a fashion that is repeatable week over week so people know where to come to find that, then maybe the second act podcast is the way to do it. Now, one of them is going to be harder to do because it's more defined, right? Just by its nature. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, Gord, I appreciate everything you've shared and, and shared your insight here with the listeners, especially when it pertains to the ego. But as we come to a close here, are there any last items you want to share that we probably didn't capture or or anything you want to highlight for listeners who are interested in working on themselves, having that level of self-awareness, or even trying to figure out how to keep that ego in check? Well, uh, the thing that I, I try to teach my 14-year-old son, um, because of course, as a father, you want to take all the hard lessons away from him and just impart the wisdom, um, is that nobody is paying as much attention to what you're doing as you think they are. So fail, be comfortable with it, embrace it, understand why, and don't let your ego get in the way of the learnings that come because you've already paid for the lesson. You've got the bill in your pocket, take the learnings. And uh, that's, that's a tough one because of course nobody likes to fail and everybody feels like when you strike out at baseball, the whole place is watching you. Um, because you're standing in the middle, but, but realistically, no one's paying any attention. They're only there to watch their kids and they're, you know, they're just happy that you struck out, not their kid or, or whatever it is. So that's, that's my, I, I wish I'd had a little bit more comfort level with, with things not going the way I'd hoped earlier in my life. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how different my life would be, but I feel like I'd probably have saved myself a lot of heartache. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess for, <laughs> For a teenage boy, how is that received? Because I often try to impart wisdom on my son and, and I see the eye rolls. But uh, so it's it's kind of like recognizing that, okay, well, I can share the wisdom, but I can also say, well, you know, here's your choices. And sometimes you're going to have to learn from the, the consequences of those choices. But I could tell you there's another way. <laughs> but ultimately, it's it's your life and it's your lesson. Yeah, I mean, emotionally, he's a 14-year-old boy, so he's not ready to regulate the emotions in a manner that that make that valuable or even remotely useful uh, advice. But, you know, cognitively, he understands that, yes, this is what dad is saying is correct, but it's just, I mean, all the, all the other things that go on in a 14-year-old boy's body, that emotional regulation piece is so far down the list that, that we struggle with it and yeah. you know all all we can do is let him know that that emotional regulation piece doesn't you know it's not who he is it's a part of who he is today and the the more you work on it today the easier it'll get tomorrow and eventually you'll get to a point where where it is a piece of who he is and hopefully you know the 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 downs don't have to be as down so that the the highs happen a little more often yeah no that's great thank you and I guess for listeners that want to either check out your podcast or find you online or social media, what are some of the ways they can do that? Uh, I really appreciate that opportunity for Yeah. So I have the second act podcast. It's available on, on Spotify and Apple and Google and all the places you find podcasts. Um, we're on pretty active on Instagram and Twitter uh, at the second act pod. And uh, we're, yeah, we're, got some some fun stuff lined up for the summer uh we've you know we've had a pretty good run here uh with with some really kind of heavy topics some people that are doing some some heavy you know mental health stuff i've got one this week coming up with a a lady named Kara fogwell from the wellness initiative that i'm really excited about but we also have some fun ones we've talked to quick dick mcdick and we talked to the former premier of saskatchewan brad wall about getting out of politics um you know, it's it's a, a unique mix. There's a lot of cool, fun stories out there of people that are doing different things with their life that not everything has to be exactly what you, you wrote down on your 
on your little piece of paper when you were in kindergarten when you said you wanted to be a fireman or whatever yeah absolutely and i think again as we mentioned one of the biggest things is it's never too late to make a change um at the same time you also have to kind of be aware of your ego if you want to make change and do something more fulfilling and be able to often even live life with your purpose um i think a lot of people do get stuck in that mindset that i can't make a change and and those stories are all very inspiring to consider when you think about it yeah it's uh, it's unique to listen to somebody who was you know even there's some people that were wildly successful but they weren't happy and they made the change and and you, they talk about what goes into those conversations with themselves uh, just before they close their eyes at night and it is it's an ego check for everybody to have to go through that and then start from you know maybe not scratch but from way back from where they were and and it was no different you know for for me to go and put that podcast out there i uh you know it was just before you hit post there was a lot of trepidation and and then you start to meet people who are listening to it and and enjoy it and it doesn't have to be thousands and thousands of people it can be tens of people and and that's all it is for me and and i wouldn't change a thing yeah yeah, no, that's great. Well, thank you again, Gord. I appreciate you taking the time and, and giving me the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, and, and thank you for, for being open and, and sharing a lot of stuff that I'm sure would be hard to share. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great to be on, Ferk, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for tuning in to another episode as always, please subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy the episodes or leave a comment in the comment section. I always love hearing from you. Thank you again and until next week.